Our goal here is to find the X and Y components of the net force acting on this charge right here. And to do that, we're going to apply Coulomb's law. We'll do it two times. The first time we will find the force acting between these two charges, and then the second time will be the force acting between these two charges. But in order for us to use Coulomb's law successfully, we need to find the distance between the two charges. The distance between the positive charges is obvious, it's symbolized by D, but less obvious is the distance between this positive and negative charge here. So we wanna make it our goal to find that distance first. We've drawn a line connecting those two charges to indicate the distance. This forms a nice right triangle. We can label the hypotenuse of that right triangle C, and in order for us to find C, we would use the Pythagorean theorem, which tells us that C squared is equal to D squared plus D squared. On the right side, we have 2d squared, and then we square root both sides. When you square root 2d squared, just be careful because you have to square root both the 2 and the d squared, leaving you with square root 2 times d. You may wish to turn that around and call it d square root of 2. So that becomes the distance between the positive charge on the y-axis and the negative charge. Next, we're going to be applying Coulomb's law two times, as noted, and perhaps we can do Coulomb's law first between the two positively charged particles. So maybe we can call this F positive positive just to indicate that it's the force between those two positive charges. We know Coulomb's law tells us that that's equal to the Coulomb's law constant, K sub E, times the magnitude of charge on this sphere here, which is capital Q, and then multiplied by the magnitude of charge on the other positive charge, which is 2Q and then divide that by the distance between them squared, which is d, so it would be d squared. We can simplify the numerator just a little bit. We might want to put that 2 in the front, so then we have 2k sub e, and then this q times this q would be q squared. So this is the magnitude of force acting between the positive charges. It's also a good idea to label the direction of that force. Now, this is positive and the charge beneath it is also positive. We know that like charges repel one another. So that means that the force acting on this charge right here would be a repulsive force. It would be pushed away from the other positive charge. So this would be sort of the direction of this F positive positive. We're gonna keep that direction in mind. So leave that vector on the drawing. We have the magnitude of that force. We also need the magnitude of the other force, which is between the positive and the negative charge. And that would be an attractive force because opposite charges attract. We can therefore draw an attractive force pulling this positive charge towards the negative. We might label this F positive negative, and we're going to find a magnitude of that force. We'll use Coulomb's law again. Maybe we'll scoot down here. We have F positive negative, would equal the Coulomb's law constant, multiplied by the capital Q, multiplied by another capital Q. Notice that even though this is negative in charge, we're only putting in the magnitude. So you still will leave that as capital Q. And then divided by the distance between them squared. That distance we successfully found earlier was D square root two, and then you square that whole thing. We can simplify this a bit in the numerator, we would multiply out the q's. This gives us k sub e times q squared. In the denominator, you have to square the d. That's going to give you d squared. You have to square the square root of 2. They cancel out, and that leaves you with just a 2 right there. So there is the magnitude of the force that is pulling that positive charge towards the negative charge. Now, we have their magnitudes, but we have to break them into components. And We'll come back to those magnitudes in a moment, but just as a matter of review, we recall that the x component of a force is equal to the magnitude of that force multiplied by the cosine of an angle. And then for the y component, it's multiplied by the sine of an angle. We've got to be really careful when we choose this angle, though. A lot of students actually make a mistake when they determine the correct angle. And the correct angle is going to be measured to the, or measured relative to the positive x axis. This is very, very important. We're gonna see what we're talking about in just a minute. But let's set up a table to keep track of all this information. So what we've done is created a table to help us organize the information. We have the two forces, F positive positive and then F positive negative, and we're breaking them into an X and a Y component. And as noted, for X components, we multiply by the cosine of an angle, and for Y components, we multiply by the sine of an angle, but we gotta get that angle straight. So let's go back to the diagram that was showing the forces. 
and I want you to focus your attention here on F positive positive. It may even help to superimpose a little mini X axis here and a little Y axis here. And you wanna ask yourself, what is the angle relative to the positive X axis of this force vector right here, the one that's pointing straight up? What is that angle between the positive X axis and that force vector? And of course that angle is a nice 90 degrees. So that means for F positive positive, when we do the components, the X component will be multiplied by the cosine of 90 degrees, and the Y component will be multiplied by the sine of 90 degrees. So that's a nice way of getting the components straight. We can now look at the other force vector, the one labeled F positive negative. We can see it's kind of pointing down and to the right. You may wish one more time to put that X axis and that Y axis there. And your goal is to figure out the measure of the angle. We can even mark it theta right there. It's kind of small, but hopefully you can see that. You want to figure that angle out. Here's the positive X axis. And this triangle is a special triangle. It's a special right triangle. It's got a right angle and has two legs that are equal in length. So that actually means that the angles are equal here and here. In other words, they're both 45 degrees. So it's a 45, 45, 90 special right triangle. And therefore, you might be able to figure out what that angle that we mark theta is. And if you're uncertain, just note that from here to here is 90 degrees. And then you have this 45 degree angle right here. So that means that theta is also 45 degrees. That way they will add up to the total of 90. But be careful, it's actually going to be negative 45 degrees. It's negative because that theta that we marked is measured in a clockwise direction. And in physics and mathematics, when your angles are clockwise, they are negative. So just make sure that you use a negative 45 degree angle for the components of F positive negative. Now, once you have that entered in, we can get rid of this picture to clear out some room. We probably want to simplify this down further. So for example, the cosine of 90 degrees, this one right here, turns out to be zero. So you actually would be multiplying this red expression by zero, which would give you a total of zero. So this actually knocks out here, which is convenient. Now the sine of 90 right over here is just one. So the red expression times one would just be the original red expression. So we can kind of knock out that sine of 90 right there. Now, the cosine of negative 45 degrees, if you weren't sure, you could punch it into a calculator, turns out to be square root of 2 over 2. For those who prefer decimals, we can say 0 0.707. So you'd be multiplying here by 0 0.707. The sine of negative 45 de degrees is negative root 2 over 2, so this becomes negative 0 0.707. Okay, now what do we do with these components? Well, we have to add them. We have to find what's called the resultant. Maybe we'll switch colors here. We'll use purple. So we'll call this the resultant here. We're going to have to add the X components together. Now that's easy because the first X component as noted was zero. So the only X component is going to be this one right here. You probably want to clean that up a little bit though. So if you look carefully, you would divide that 0 0.707 by two because the two is in the denominator. So if we do that, we're going to get about 0.354. So this is going to be 0 0.354. And then we're going to have k sub e q squared all over d squared. So this actually becomes the total x component right here. On the y side of things, again, we have to add the components together. It's a little dicier because of the, the fractions involved here. Maybe what we should do is divide this negative 0 0.707 by two. And of course, that's going to give us the negative 0.354 as well. So at the risk of this being a little confusing, let's actually kind of change the way we wrote this. This would actually turn out to be negative 0 0.354, and that would be k sub e times q squared over d squared. And then over uh, here, so we can kind of cross that out right there. The red expression is just two. So we actually have like terms. If you look carefully, you've got a k e, excuse me, k sub e q squared over d squared. And then here you have a k sub e q squared over d squared. So these two are like terms. We're gonna add them together. And when you add like terms, you just add the coefficients. So you're gonna add the two to this negative 0.354. And if you do that, you get about 1.65. So, the y component, the total y component is 1.65. This will be k sub e times q squared over d squared. And that would be 
the total y component of the net force. And there it is. That's all the question wanted for. Symbolic expressions for the total x component of the net force and the total y component of the net force.